Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Yi Ding, who's uh, going to be talking today about polygenic risk scores. And I'm going to keep the introduction short just so Yi has more time to, to present her work. Um, Yi joined us in the bioinformatics PG program after completing a master's from Harvard School of Public Health. And it's particularly exciting today to see some people from uh, HSPH in our listening channel. So um, he will answer the question today, what is so interesting about polygenic risk scores, given that you're seeing every other day a new paper coming out in top tier journals. So go ahead, E. you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Bogdan, for the uh, introduction. And uh, thank you all for giving me this great chance to share our res latest research. Uh, today, I'm going to introduce our latest work on estimating the uncertainty in individual polygenic risk score and assessing its impact on its clinical utility. As we all know, our phenotype or disease status are determined by both genetic components and non-genetic factors. For non-genetic factors, it usually involves dietary style, for example, whether you are meat lover or you are a vegan. And there are also other factors such as whether you smoke or not, and you, whether you drink or not, and how much exercise you will take per uh, per day. And there are also genetic components. For this part, depending on what type of disease you are looking at, it can be monogenic or polygenic. For example, most Mendelian diseases are usually monogenic, which means they are controlled by a limited number of genetic variants with very large effect sizes. While for most complex traits, like type 2 diabetes, breast cancer, height, they are controlled by uh, they will have a polygenic genetic architecture, which means they are controlled by many genetic variants with small effect sizes. Let's take coronary artery disease, for example. Uh, the variants that can cause, uh, can cause the coronary artery other disease are dispersed in the whole genome. And if we know the true causal variants and know their true causal effect sizes, we can compute a genetic value or genetic risk by this linear combination. Uh, but in reality, uh, we don't know the true, which are the true causal variants and their true effect sizes. Usually we have to infer them from a very large GWAS data set. And from the, uh, and then we can compute a polygenic risk score based on the inferred genetic causal variance and causal effect sizes. Therefore, polygenic risk score is an estimate of the genetic value. And this polygenic risk score can inform clinical decision making. For example, based on certain threshold, we can uh, separate the individuals into low risk and high risk. And for the high risk individuals, we can, we can take some actions to prevent the disease or lower the risk of, uh, the risk of this disease. For example, for a uh, individual with high risk for uh, high genetic risk for cardiovascular disease, you can advise more life uh, uh, more healthy lifestyles. And also uh, it can be used for early screening. For example, uh, it is, a, a woman are advised to start their mammography screening since the year of 50. And for individuals with very large uh, polygenic risk score for breast cancer, you can uh, they can start the screening earlier so that they can detect the disease earlier. And for those are not, my, it, it might be possible to uh, delay their screening to reduce uh, health cost. And there are, in some cases, there can also be therapeutic intervention. Uh, so for example, uh, static treatment is usually used as a primary prevention of the coronary heart disease. However, the usage of the statin is controversial because on one hand, it can reduce the uh, CHD risk by lowering the LDL level in the blood. But on the other hand, it can also bring some other side effects. For example, it can increase the risk for the type 2 diabetes. Therefore, it is essential to identify subgroups that can benefit more from the statin treatment. And uh, in this study conducted by Natarajan et al., the researchers find that individuals with a high polygenic risk score can benefit more from the statin treatment. For example, the, in the left panel, it shows that the low genetic risks 
uh, for the low uh, genetic risk individuals, statin can reduce the uh, coronary heart disease event rate by 23%, comparing the statin treatment group and the placebo group. Uh, while for the high genetic risk, uh, a genetic risk group, the statin treatment can have a much larger uh, re reduction in the risk. It can be 44%. And all this evidence and along with many others in the literature show the potential of the PRS in the clinical setting and the people are motivated to implement the PRS in the clinical practice to facilitate uh, personalized medicine. Therefore, a PRS with a very high accuracy and a low noise is essential to serve this purpose. And the, cohort, the PRS accuracy has been well studied on the cohort level. For example, for the binary trait, people will usually compute a arc value from this uh, rock curve, which can show, show how well a PRS can distinguish the uh, cases from controls. And there are also co squared correlations between uh, and for continuous trait, and people will usually compute a uh, squared correlation between the PRS and the phenotype to see how well it can uh, predict the phenotype. And usually the accuracy of this cohort level, uh, PR, uh, the, the cohort level accuracy of PRS are bounded by the heritability. But when it comes to a specific individual, uh, Oh, we have to know like how much noise is there uh, for this specific individual and oh, well, how much uncertainty is there. However, these problems has not been started yet, but it will impact the uh, in clinical interpretation of PRS. For example, for this given individual, uh, if we look at its PRS estimates alone, without considering any uncertainty, uh, we will find that this one individual should be classified into a high-risk group. However, if we take the uncertainty into, into consideration and um, create a confidence interval for it, we will find that these PRS estimates actually have a very lar large uncertainty and it will, uh, we will not be, after accounting for this, PRS uncertainty, we are not, we are not sure like where exactly uh, we should place this individual and what treatment should we assign to this individual. So how does this, uh, how does this PRS uncertainty come from? So as we previously said that PRS is only an estimate of the genetic risk uh, based on the inferior genetic effect sizes and the genetic causal status. However, this inference problem is very difficult for two reasons. First, uh, there are million markers in our genome and most of the time they are very highly correlated. And second, uh, the genetic effect sizes are usually very small, but the noise is very large. And we can further explain it with this toy example. For example, like these two, uh, this type of data is what we usually will see when we construct a PRS. First, we will have a marginal effect sizes, which is the uh, regression coefficient of a trait against a single SNP. And also we will have an LD matrix. And here uh, we have an LD matrix, which indicates the first SNP is independent of the rest two SNP. And the rest two SNPs are highly correlated. And given such kind of GWAS observations, we will conclude with high certainty that the first SNP will be a causal SNP with effect sizes too. And but for the second and the third SNPs, because they are highly correlated, there might be multiple causal uh, effect sizes and causal configurations will be compatible with this observation. For example, it's possible that the second SNP is causal and the third SNP is just tagging the effect, effect of the second. And under such kind of control configuration, if we are given an individual who carries a genetic variant at the second SNP, we will give a very high PRS prediction and we might conclude it as a high risk individual. However, there's another setting that's equally probable. It's very likely that the, second, the third SNP is causal and the second SNP is just 
is just tagging the effect of the third. And under this, such configuration, uh, the PRS for the same individual will be zero. And we will conclude it has a, uh, it a, is a low risk individual. And there are also other possible configurations. For example, both of them can uh, be causal variants and the effect size will be split up between these two SNPs. And this time it will have a moderate PRS, which but is still then uh, has a very low risk. So here we show that for the same GWAS observation uh, due to the LD and the environmental noise, we for the same individual, we can have different uh, PRS prediction and they will lead to different stratification. So how do we obtain this uh, uncertainty in reality? Uh, so here we propose a general Bayesian approach to obtain the uh, PRS uncertainty from the real data. And then we use LD prior to as an example. First, uh, we will construct a posterior of the genetic effect sizes data given the uh, by combining the likelihood of the data and the posterior distribution of these genetic effects, uh, which is parameterized with the proportion of caudal SNPs in the whole genome and the total heritability of this chain. And um, due to the fact that uh, the, our genetic data are highly dimensional, usually it's intractable to solve such a kind of a posterior. So therefore we use MCMC to sample from this posterior distribution. And here each beta is a vector of genetic effects for all the variants that we considered. And we can have B, uh, B samples of uh, beta to approximate this posterior distribution. And next, what most um, PRS did is that they will summarize these uh, MCMC samplings into the posterior mean. And then they will output it to predict an individual's genetic risk given its genotype. Here, what we did instead is that we will take the full ad uh, advantage of these four MCMC samplings. And for each of these genetic effect, we will compute a polygenic risk score based on uh, an individual's genotype. So therefore, if we have B samples of uh, posterior uh, uh, B samples of genetic effect, we will have B samples of PRS, which can form a posterior distribution of a genetic value or genetic risk. And from this genetics, uh, for, from this distribution, we can get um, information more than this uh, PRS estimate. First, we can of course get the posterior mean as an estimate, but we can also get the posterior variance and what's more a credible interval from that. For example, a 95% credible interval in theory is expected to contain the uh, true genetic value 95% of the time. And we saw uh, a bunch of simulations show that such kind of credible interval is well calibrated. And next, uh, how do we assess the impact on stratification with this information? So we can classify the individuals into uh, four groups based on the PRS estimates and the credible interval. So first, as opposed to traditional uh, patient PRS stratification did, we can stratify the individuals into low risk category and high risk category by checking whether the posterior mean is uh, smaller or higher than this uh, pre-specified threshold. And next, what we did is we will compare the credible interval with this pre-specified threshold. This process is analogous to the hypothesis testing in the frequent statistics. So uh, if this credible interval does not overlap with this threshold, we will say, okay, this P individual's PRS is significantly different from the threshold. And therefore we can include it's a certain classification. However, if a real, uh, if an credible interval overlaps with a threshold, we will say, well, this individual's PRS is not significantly different from this threshold. Therefore, we conclude it's a uncertain low risk individual. And similar, similarly, we will have uncertain high risk classification and a certain high risk classification. Next, we apply this uh, to process to 11 chains in the UK Bio Bank. And we find that there's large degree of PRS 
individual PRS uncertainty. And then we take the BMI, for example, population, and we score at 95%. And here we see that uh, because we set the threshold to 90th percentile, there's about 10% individuals are belong to the high risk group and 90% of individuals belong to a low risk group. Um, however, among these 10% uh, individuals, about 0% of this classification is certain. And among these 90% low risk classification, about only, only about like 15% of the diagnoses are, uh, are are certain. And we can see this consistent large uncertainty across all the chains we investigate. But we also notice there's a, uh, different degrees of uncertainty among all these chains. And we find that uh, chains with high heritability and a low polygenicity will show a lower stratification uncertainty. For example, if we compare height with poly mass index, they have these two traits have similar level of polygenicity. However, height will have uh, twice the heritability of BMI. And what we detect is the height will have a higher proportion of high risk diagnoses that are certain. And if we compare hair color and the body mass uh, index, we will find that they have similar level of heritability. However, the hair color has a much lower polygenicity. Therefore, it will have a higher proportion of high risk that are certain compared with BMI. We also notice that for body minor density uh, in heel, although it has a high heritability and low polygenicity, but it's, um, uh, the pro it, it is classification is still quite uncertain. This is because like uh, the sample size of the bone minor density in here is quite small in the UK bio bank compared with other trees. And if we are interested, like we have a formula in our paper to describe the for the describe the relation between uh, this uncertainty and uh, polygenicity, heritability, and sample size. Also uh, here, I want to make a small clarification. So as we see, like uh, not all these traits we look at are uh, disease related. And it might be a little bit confusing to use high risk or low risk. But what we mean here is like above threshold or lower than threshold, we just use for the high risk or low risk for simplicity in the talking. So uh, after we have seen that there is such a large uncertainty in the classification, we are curious to see how uh, what what's the variance in the PRS based ranking. Especially, we want to see the individuals at the risk uh, stratification threshold. Like what is their possible true ranking relative rankings in this population? And for example, for the nineties, these two individuals. Uh, which are uh, uh, around the 90th percent of our risk in this population. And if we take a specific genetic posterior sampling and compute the PRS, and then compute the ranking based on the PRS for all individuals, and we will find actually this individual might have a lower risk and this yellow individuals will have a higher risk. However, if we take another sampling, this yellow individual, which high risk will move to a lower risk end, and this blue individual will move to a higher. And we repeat this process for all um, posterior samplings of the genetic effect. And therefore, we will, for each individual, we will have B uh, ranking, which forms a posterior distribution from which we can get a 95% credible interval. And in real data, we find the two relative ranking can range uh, can vary a lot for individuals at a 90th percentile. Let's take a BMI for example. So for individuals that are uh, class, uh, are at 90th percentile risk in the whole population, their true genetic risk can range from uh, 31, uh, 31 percentile to 98.9 percentile. And if we average across all these traits, overall for individuals at 90th percentile, uh, its true ranking can range from 44% to 99%. So this means that uh, for the individuals that are classified at, uh, 
uh, at 90 90 percent higher of risk. Their true risk can be uh, can actually be very low. Even uh, it's possible they are actually uh, below the population average. So with that all being said, we have shown that there is large uncertainty in this uh, in this PRS, and it will bring trouble to the in clinical interpretation. So how do we uh, integrate this uncertainty into stratification for better uh, clinical decision making? So here, instead of this binary classification of low risk and high risk, uh, we propose a probabilistic stratification score, so which will reflect the probability uh, of a genetic value, value to be larger than a certain threshold which can be calculated as a proportion of uh, posterior PRS samples that are larger than the threshold. For example, this uh, blue individual may have a 40% chance that his uh, genetic value will be larger than threshold. And for this yellow individual, there might be 68%. And this score can be used to inform personalized uh, personalized, personalized false positive and false negative rate. For example, for this individual who has a uh, probability of genetic value larger than threshold equal to 68%. Uh, if we classify it as a high risk, and it, because it still has a 40% chance to below this risk, as therefore the probability probability of a false positive diagnosis will be 40%. And if we can we classify it into a low risk individuals, because it still has 60% chance to be a high risk individual, therefore, uh, the false negative rate will be 60%. And given a specific cost function, we can compute the expected loss or, or expected gain for each classification and therefore make the best clinical decision for this individual. For example, uh, here's a pseudo example. So if, uh, uh, if the false positive and the false negative rate is equal, uh, cost is equal to one, and under this situation, the expected cost for a high risk diagnosis will be 0.4, and the expected cost for a low risk will be 0.6. And at this, uh, this situation, we tend to classify this individual as a high risk individual. So, uh, uh, a situation related to this cost function is that if we care about the classification accuracy. And there's also situations where uh, a false negative will cost more than false positive. For example, for the, uh, for the, uh, for the bone minor density, if you have a false, uh, if you have a false positive classification, uh, the cost might be just, you have to get regular uh, screening of bones every year, but uh, if you are classified as a false negative, you might experience a very major procedure in, in a later part of your life, which will incur a larger cost. And here uh, we can compute this, uh, the expected lost for the high risk as 0.4 and for low risk as 1.8. Under this situation, we will still prefer a high risk. And there are also scenarios where the false positive will uh, have a larger cost than the false negative. And then for this situation, we might prefer to conclude that this individual will be low risk and assign the corresponding intervention. Now it's time to conclude the whole presentation. So PRS is really hard these days. It's not only a not only a very useful research tool, but it's also a very promising element in the clinical setting, especially for the personalized medicine. So up until now, we have shown that what there what is PRS uncertainty and how do we compute PRS uncertainty. We also show that even at the scale of UK Bio Bank level data set, there is still substantial uncertainty in the PRS estimates, which might impact its downstream application. And we also propose a way to integrate PRS in the decision making process. The take home message is that PRS is only estimate of genetic risk that comes with large uncertainty. Therefore, you have to, uh, you have to integrate this large uncertainty in 
all the PRS analysis you did. And the larger PRS uncertainty also should be incorporated into methods for risk stratification and prediction. And however, uh, the real world situation is always more complicated than the research on the paper. And a, a good predictive model should always consider not only PRS, but also multiple other clinical factors to make better resistance. Uh, to, to for better clinical decision making. So for the future work, we will try to integrate uncertainty in the PRS and along with other uh, uncertainty in other clinical risk factors pro to provide a robust and well calibrated predictive model for personalized medicine. And if you are interested in our work, please check out our paper on bioarchive. And I also want to take this chance to acknowledge all the authors on this paper, uh, and also uh, which include Kangchen, Catherine, uh, Sandra, Florian, Biani, Sharon, and Bogdan. And I also want to thank my wonderful lab mates who create such a supportive working environment, and without whom I cannot complete such kind of job. Yeah, that's all. Any questions? <laughs>